So thank you. Thank you again, Annie. I advocate for a world in which children whose parents are involved in the criminal justice system are considered and their needs safeguarded at every step of the criminal justice process. I have the pleasure of introducing our next conversation, Innovative Models and the Role of Impact Investing. So please join me in welcoming Alex Breen, Senior Associate at Seedco, David Fisher, Executive Director of the New York City Center for Youth Employment, and Tracy Sue, a Director at the Boston-based Social Finance, in a conversation with Jesse Lehman, Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Coalition. I think it's on now. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Carolina. Can I just one more round of applause for Carolina? Uh, and thank those of you who aren't in one of our workshops for listening to this, this panel uh, about uh, an innovative model and the role of impact investing. Um, so we pulled together this group of panelists today uh, because of a collaboration called Career Lift uh, that the three organizations that you guys are here representing uh, have been instrumental in making happen. Uh, we're gonna hear a little about what CareerLift is. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes first. Uh, I wanna note that uh, Tara Colton, one of the board members from the Employment and Training Coalition and the executive director of Seedco uh, was gonna be on the panel with us today. Seedco has been a leader in CareerLift. Um, but Tara, uh, Tara had a, a family health issue she had to deal with, uh, so she got drawn away from us this week. Alex, thank you for jumping in at the last minute. Alex knows a heck of a lot about career lift and will ably replace Tara. Um, and, and then I just wanna start off with the first question, which is for some context. Uh, why does uh, you know, outcomes-based financing, which is this career lift model, why does it matter? Uh, why get involved in that sort of thing? I'm happy to start and take that one. Hi, everyone. I'm Tracy Sue with Social Finance. Um, and so why outcomes-based financing? I'd, I'd love to start with a statistic. That's kind of how we think and learn at, at Social Finance. But it's something we, in our work, call the 0.1% problem. Um, and the sticks goes, I think, since 1975, of the 200,000 human service-oriented nonprofits that are, are, that, that are out there, only 200, or 0.1%, have annual revenues that exceed $50 million. And that, for me, is a number that's just stunning, given the complexity of challenges and intractable social issues we're trying to resolve in this country, certainly, uh, globally as well. Um, and as you alluded to, and as I think we are all familiar with, uh, as it pertains to service provision, nonprofits, and the like, um, Typically, today, the way the world thinks about funding those solutions uh, comes from government and philanthropy. Um, and we were in the business of trying to reimagine the roles of, of these entities, especially recognizing that increasingly uh, from the capital markets we're seeing not only appetite to solve for double bottom lines, but now triple bottom lines as well. How do we solve for risk, return, and impact? Um, and so when we think about outcomes-based financing, it's really about reimagining the roles of government, of nonprofits, of the private sector, and bringing them together to think about, A, how do we align on what success means that brings these parties together so that we can finance long-lasting solutions? And I think that was really the genesis of, of, of one of many reasons that brought all of us together to, to initiate the career lift work. And uh, I think, David, you're going to answer the next one, so maybe you can also weigh in a little on, on why it matters. But I, I do want to, for the audience, hear a little more about how CareerLift came to be. Um, it's a relatively new uh, initiative, and, and David at CYE was instrumental in helping making it happen. So tell us a little about the genesis. Sure. I mean, just the, uh, the basics of the program, um, the ambition, the objective is to improve retention and advancement outcomes for young adults who are newly in the labor market, um, who don't have college degrees and who don't necessarily have a ton of work experience, very deep personal networks that can provide support, uh, very clear and in-demand, demonstrable technical skills. Um, and um, as we began to 
look at this uh, a couple years ago, the, the original impetus was the, uh, the 100,000 Opportunities Initiative, which I'm sure uh, at least some of you are familiar with. For those that aren't, uh, this was a coalition that was launched in 2015, uh, really spearheaded by Starbucks uh, and, and, and the, Howard, the Howard Schultz Foundation, the, the, the uh, CEO of Starbucks. And, um, they put together a coalition of about 40 employers uh, that made public commitments to collectively hire 100,000 opportunity youth uh, over the next the, the following few years. And the way that they launched the model was uh, with in several demonstration cities where they would convene these big what they called splash events. They would rent out like uh, the United Center in Chicago. Um, uh, where the bulls play and, uh, you know, get a bunch of entertainers and inspiring speakers and then almost do like this cattle call job matching uh, of literally hundreds of young people with employers. And it would generate a nice press release, uh, you know, favorable coverage in the dailies the next day um, and generally a headline, something like, uh, you know, 4,000 kids went to the United Center and... 1,700 of them got jobs. Um, when you checked back a few weeks later, the actual number was probably more like 300 or 400 because it's one thing to make a job offer in the moment, it's another to do the background check, fill out the paperwork, I mean, all these other things um, you know, that, may, that may knock a young person out of contention. And for us, that really got to the core of the problem with their model. There was, there was a, a disconnect between the immediate gratification uh, of a CEO and an intervention that could really make a lasting positive uh, employment outcome for a young person. So we thought about a different way to do it. We said, we don't, we don't want to do your model. We do want to participate in the project. We certainly want your money. So what else can we do instead? Well, rather than focusing on placement, uh, which fortunately, you know, right now in a tight labor market, the challenge isn't so much getting the job as keeping the job we were going to go into the, uh, the subsequent experience, look at, look at retention and advancement. And there were a couple national models uh, that we took, we took inspiration from. Probably the most prominent was the work-life partnership in Colorado, uh, where they really looked, they, they would station what they called navigators on site with participating employers. Um, and workers could discreetly kind of go to these navigators for assistance, either with uh, life issues outside the job that were just interfering with their ability to get to work on time and perform well, everything from housing to transportation to uh, immediate debts to, to childcare, or they could be problems in the workplace, you know, dealing with a difficult supervisor, um, scheduling policies that were sort of inimical to, 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 to quality of life. So we looked at work-life partnership and we looked at uh, the Young Adult Sectoral Employment Program here in New York City, which was spearheaded by Jobs First NYC. And that was a, a sector-focused initiative that was really uh, aggressively targeting the population we cared about. So really what CareerLift was, was putting together the population uh, and the expertise that Jobs First brought in there, the other member of our, our coalition. I don't know if there are any Jobs First folks in the room right now, but shout out to Jobs First. Uh, could not have built this without them. Um, with the services that we were talking about, uh, that Work-Life Partnership and The Source and Grand Rapids and some other organizations had been, um, uh, had been experimenting with. And then uh, as we began to talk with the Rockefeller Foundation who were interested in funding, they said, uh, a part of our interest is exploring this notion of third party payers. Uh, and they encouraged us to connect with social finance, which has built out a, a portfolio of pay for success initiatives and was really, as Tracy was saying, excited about exploring that in workforce development. Um, and that was kind of how, that was how the, the partnership and the project came together. Uh, thank you, and also just want to give kudos. I feel like it was two years ago I was at another event just like this, uh, and we heard about uh, the work-life partnership from Colorado, and I remember there being some chatter in the room, well, New York never listens to what happens in other cities and other places, so kudos on listening and then bringing a model like that here. Um, okay, so CareerLift has launched. Uh, Alex, uh, I'd love it if you could tell us a little about how it's going some data, some information about you know, what we're seeing from the pro uh, program so far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and please stop me. I'm going to throw out a number of data points. <laughs> hey, right we now. like data here. If, if, right. there are, if I'm just throwing out too many numbers, I'm not making any sense, 
you know, please, please say something and stop me. Um, just for context, uh, Youth Advancing the Workplace is a four-year-old sectoral employment program that actually grew out independent of the work that Jobs First was doing uh, with um, Stanley Isaac Center and that, those groups of employers. Uh, YW recruits young adults who have completed vocational training programs uh, and internship programs at partner organizations, provides those individuals with six days of industry-specific job readiness training prior to job placement at a Seedco employer partner. All of Seedco's employer partners, for the most part, are small and medium-sized. All of them demonstrate a commitment to offering competitive wages, consistent scheduling, comprehensive on-the-job training, and offer clear and attainable pathways for professional advancement. The program supports all of its employees in employment for 104 weeks or two years. So when we launched, uh, when we launched and you know, took part in this interview process with social finance, much of what we were thinking was, you know, is this something that's going to work? Are employers even going to be interested in taking part in interviews where they're revealing their turnover rates, they're revealing their turnover costs, and they're talking about the steps, tools, and mechanisms that they use to retain their employers? And the answer was overwhelmingly yes, with not a single employer being invited to participate in an interview and saying, no, this is not something we were interested in. Perhaps the, the most striking thing that came of this interview process was actually the, the quantitative component of the process. Uh, we interviewed 10 food industry employers uh, and learned of a range of turnover costs that range from $2,000 on the low end to $5,000 on the high end. We can confidently say that in New York City, the average cost of a single instance of employee turnover at the entry level is $3,500 per person. That would be per a, a prep cook or a sandwich maker. The, the, the caveat and the interesting piece about that is that the annual turnover rate ranges from 70%, and that is on the very low end, to more than 200% on the high end, meaning that a single position would turn over more than two times over the course in a calendar year. Seedco and social finance interviews employers who are employing prep cooks, and you know, the average salary of a prep cook would be somewhere in the ballpark of $33,000 to $36,000 a year. They were actually spending an additional ten dollars to $12,000 just on lost turnover costs that derive from overtime wages, lost productivity, um, and a slew of other costs that might be, not be super apparent on the surface, but certainly emerge through these 90-minute quantitative and qualitative interviews. What we also found was the significant qualitative impact of rampant employee turnover. When entry-level employees leave a job, they often do so without notice. Schedules need to be work last, reworked last minute, overtime needs to be paid, and managers or owner operators oftentimes are the ones who have to fill in the gaps. Employers note that staffing shortages result in diminished service and a reduced quality of product, Despite knowing that turnover was expensive and harmful to staff cohesion, many of the employers that Seedco and Social Finance interviewed accepted rampant turnover as a cost of doing business in the food industry. Some of the larger, almost universally, employers that Seedco and Social Finance interviewed suspected that turnover was fueled by issues that occurred outside of the workplace, but self-identified as being ill-equipped to help their employees navigate those resources and challenges. Several employees spoke of contracting with decentralized employee assistance programs, that, but noted that entry-level employees rarely called upon the service. In the words of a national employer, nobody calls the EAP. Seedco believes that there is a market failure at work. Entry-level turnover is too often driven by challenges outside of the workplace, such as transportation, childcare, financial insecurity, and housing instability. Quality interview, qualitative excuse me, interviews revealed that Seedco referred employees are more likely to be retained and advanced than employees that are hired from other sources. Qualitative interviews also reveal that the employers that Seedco is partnering with are willing to play, pay for employee retention. Okay, so I'm sold, right? <laughs> but I'm the choir. 
Um, you know, I, I am you know, predisposed to see all the, the truth to this, the notion that there is uh, money left on the table by turnover, that if we could get employers to pay for better retention, that it'd be a win-win for everyone. And for the sector, we clearly need a third stream of, of financing because philanthropy is tapped out and we can't convince government to invest more and we need to get the businesses at the table. All right. But I'm the choir. I'm sold easily. So what I want to know from you guys who've been trying to bring this to New York and, and make it real, what have the challenges been, in it, both in either an implementation, but I think especially, what are the challenges in convincing people, um, businesses, I imagine, at the top of the list, but you tell me, um, to, to opt into a, a model like this? Yeah. I'm happy to start just from the perspective of uh, when, when we were bringing this concept into fruition. Certainly from social finances perspective, as, as more of the financial intermediary, you know, we're very objective thinkers, we're very data-driven. We thought, wow, so long as we can build an argument that you know, prevention and investing in prevention, meaning can we help uh, these employers not only fill uh, open sp slots, but ensure that we're training folks so that they stay longer and are retained longer and potentially improve productivity, wow, like the numbers should speak for themselves, and, and we heard some of the numbers just now. What was very surprising to me as we started engaging in some of these employer interviews was to find that regardless of small or large employers, oftentimes HR and finance just weren't talking to one another. You could have your HR strategy about how you want to invest in your talent, how you want to encourage productivity growth, encourage training for future promotion opportunities. That was one story. But then when we asked about how that strategy plays in with your the turnover rates that one might be seeing in-house and the cost of that turnover, the numbers weren't as, as prevalent. And so I, f I felt like a lot of our initial work was, was just triangulating within employers to understand, well, what is your holistic strategy as it pertains to your people, but driven by the, the potential longer-term uh, bottom-line benefits you could have if only you were to invest in your people from the get-go, as opposed to saying, oh, I expect a certain percentage of turnover, and, and I will just manage that with my business. So that, for me, was a huge learning, and, and, and part of the story is to say, we are really shifting minds from the outset in understanding how we can invest in people and quantifying the future benefit that your business may not be seeing. Um, I think we're all in, in this because we're hoping in the long run. We are really uh, trying to encourage certainly employers, if not government and other funders of workforce services, that this ought to just be the, the, the way of doing business that benefits everybody. Anybody else want to talk? Yeah. Um I think there's, there's an informational challenge and a conceptual challenge. Uh, the informational challenge, and I, I feel like um, uh, Alex and Tracy both kind of got at this, um, is really the difference between knowing you have a stomach ache and knowing that uh, the, you know, the lining of your gastric, gastric tract is uh, inflamed and you should be eating different foods so you don't exacerbate the problem. Uh, knowing that there's a lot of turnover and, and some costs is the stomach ache. Uh, all the data points that Alex talked about is the, the specific diagnosis and prescription. So kind of getting down to that uh, is the first challenge you have to overcome. The second challenge, the, the somewhat more abstract one, uh, has to do with whose problem it really is. Um, part of our sort of collective mythology uh, is that everybody, you know, we're we're, we're Americans and we're pioneering and we're entrepreneurial and everybody's charged with kind of forging their own path in the labor market. And uh, to the extent that this is an issue for anybody, it's an issue for the low-income worker and if they care to deal with it, the employer. Because a lot of employers, by the way, just kind of accept high turnover as the way things are and, and just a, a kind of built-in factor. I think it wasn't until we started presenting them with some of these numbers that they said, oh, well, we can, we can cut our six-month turnover rate from 40% to 20% and it'll save us how much money? Well, that sounds good. Uh, and then, you know, by the same token, does government, does society uh, have, a role, have a role to play in this? How do we benefit? Well, right now it's a tight labor market, and as I said, it's much easier to find a job than to keep a job. Uh, the keeping a job, that's going to be what differentiates when the market isn't as tight, when demand isn't as high, when you don't have uh, these factors where, you know, you can perhaps choose between different kinds of low-paying jobs based on uh, a whole range of factors. You better have some, you could almost call them labor market survival skills. And I think that we all have a stake 
in helping the people who don't have the educational credentials, who don't have as long of a track record as full of a resume, who don't have those folks who can validate for them or whom they can turn to for support in hard times. Getting them those things uh, is something that, that really should matter to all of us. Great, thank you. And yes, it's, I can imagine a substantial challenge. Uh, I, I should ask the other side of that coin, which is, you know, what are the strengths uh, that you have found in working together of career lift? What, what has enabled this model to actually get off the ground here in New York when it is such a sort of inherent problem? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I think one of the things that I didn't necessarily anticipate when we entered this project was that once we, once the proposition uh, was put out to employers of this is a service that is offered for free right now, but we are aiming to make this something that is going to be fee for service. Mm -hmm. And we saw all of our employer partners upon kind of that, upon these initial quantitative interviews responding by I think kind of the universal response has been, how can I access these services and what services are you offering that we are not taking advantage of? And we've also found a number of employers who when, con when forced to confront the exorbitant amount of money that they're paying to people who they're not really developing but are just operating in these roles very transactionally for you know, one to three months, I think the response has been, what can we collaboratively do to address this challenge, and then how do we disseminate these best findings? Um, I'll point to uh, an example of Ovenly, who has been um, one of Seedco's uh, core empl employer partners on this project since 2015, uh, when we were just breaking out the sectoral component of youth advancing the workplace. And we had had a, a young person there, and the person had, you know, has now been there for 36 months and has been, the entire time they've been working there has been, meet, you know, attending monthly financial coaching sessions with Seedco support staff. Um, Ovenly recognized that when this individual did not access these services, there was a significant dip in their performance at work. There was a significant increase in no, uh, not necessarily no call, no shows, but, but absentee uh, call outs. We were then, several years later, able to present them with, with a piece of data, which was that through these 36 financial coaching sessions, this individual had reduced their debt and increased their savings by more than $26,000. They realized this was also the only individual at the company who had been working there for three years, and this was something that resonated with them. The response to this has been that now Seedco, every one Wednesday a month, has a financial coach who's on-site meeting with Seedco referred employees. The employer says, if we're gonna be paying someone $15 an hour from their regular salary to meet with a financial coach, and that's going to increase their financial, you know, their feeling of financial insecurity, make them feel optim more optimistic about professional development opportunities, and make them feel that Ovenly is an employer that's invested in their well-being and professional advancement, this is the best $15 we've spent. And I think that had we not necessarily, you know, I think these conversations could have, you know, come to fruition organically. But I think that presenting employers with evidence on just how grave of a, of a problem this is and how severe the situation is has really forced those conversations to happen. Any other strengths that people want to share? I mean, I think the latent strength um, of this project, of this collaboration is the opportunity just to advance our specific knowledge uh, through the data points and the anecdotes that, that uh, Alex was sharing and our general understanding of perspectives of stakeholders other than whichever one that we're sitting, you know, sitting in at the moment. Uh, uh, there was a deputy mayor in the last administration who, uh, who had a line about collaboration that I, I thought was pretty apt. He said, collaboration is an unnatural act between unwilling partners. And that, uh, you know, unfortunately has been the, the operational reality in our field for a really long time. Um, and for a whole bunch of reasons, both uh, you know the the push of what we were talking about at the outset, which is that our traditional funding sources are are rapidly shrinking, and you know that's not likely to reverse. Um, and the pull, which is that we increasingly understand that 
you need all these stakeholders engaged and, and at the table uh, to do this work well and to s effectively serve both our job seeker clients and our employer clients. Um, that has to change. Like collaboration shouldn't be the exception. Collaboration is going to have to become the norm. Great. All right. So we've got almost five minutes left, and so I want to uh, ask you guys to, you know, having gone through this so far and, and knowing about models from elsewhere. How do we go big with this, right? How do we make outcomes-based financing a bigger slice of the pie and, and a more normal thing in the, the workforce sector? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and we certainly welcome everyone in the room to, to do some visioning with us. But I mean, taking David's last point, this is, I think at the outset, an exercise of bringing together uncommon partners. And so I think certainly in social finances work, uh, where again, our role is at the intermediary, we're sitting in, in the middle trying to bring all these parties together. What goes above and beyond is, is I think to your earlier point, well, who is really feeling that pain um, and who is owning that pain? Um, and can we identify a significant first mover that can really help us change minds. And so I think in this project, it was being able to identify some of these willing employers who, once we were able to share some of the numbers and the data, wow, they were really empowered to, to move. And so, um, you know, we're doing some work in, in Philadelphia akin to this where we were really fortunate. I was telling Alex earlier that there's a large technology employer who's who's feeling the pain despite the... the um, the, the limited uh, um, labor market, um, you know, jobs are being at the risk of automation. And so they're really feeling that. And, and in addition to needing individuals to, to fill those jobs, they, they want to help retrain and identify folks. So how do we find those, those large movers who understand the, the potential economic story here and, and bring them into the partnership mix sooner rather than later? Yeah, I think it's really um, a matter of building the case. And uh, as you've heard from my colleagues, we are well down the road to telling that story in the specific context of career lift, uh, kind of showing both in the abstract what turnover costs are, what return on investment can be, um, and uh, just more generally, what all the stakeholders have to gain or have to lose by, 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 by action and inaction. I think when you start to do that, and then as Tracy was saying, you begin to build uh, a roster of champions and validators, then it, you know, the dominoes start falling a little bit more easily. Uh, business moves, then government moves, then philanthropy moves, or you can, you can switch the order. But as folks both perceive uh, a shared interest, which I think is already the case, um, and a viable path toward uh, collaboratively fulfilling that interest, then, then hopefully this becomes easier over time. I think that's, 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 how, we, that's how we go big. Yeah, I, I would point out that one of the fun collaborative, one of the probably the coolest uh, things about this collaborative has been the opportunity to partner with with social finance and with CYE and really kind of get a sense of, of what's taking place in this arena on, uh, what's taking place uh, in this specific arena on a national scale. And Seedco has got a significant presence in Memphis. Uh, we've thus far interviewed five employers that range in size from 45 to 5,000. Um, and they're feeling similar pain points. They're experiencing similar rates of turnover. Uh, the minimum wage is lower, and in general, you know, salary costs are lower, but it doesn't, that, that doesn't lessen their impact. And I don't think that the conversations that we're having today need to be limited to young adult sectoral employment. I think they can be applied very broadly to the, to workforce development systems. And, you know, one of the, one of the remarkable things is, Despite how significant of an issue this is, there is so little literature out there that speaks to the problem. So much so that you know mo most of these smaller businesses had no idea what their turnover costs. You know they couldn't even begin to understand. And you know I think being able to put something out there for other people to consume and to take and run with, it's going to be really cool. What, or it's going to be really interesting to see what future iterations of a model like this will look like. All right. Well, that's the note we're going to end on. Uh, a round of applause for these great panelists who have built Career Lift. And uh, we look forward to more. Thank you.